when it comes to the uh, biological interpretation of uh, metabolomics data, that's where uh, we have to remember that uh, metabolome is intimately related to other ohms, and that is um, sort of, you know, schematically represented by uh, this slide. And uh, so um, uh, I think the number of metabolites uh, in the metabolome, in human metabolome, for example, is still sort of up for uh, debate. We will not, you know, talk too much about the uh, numbers, but it's clear that uh, uh, metabolites are involved in various uh, reactions that are catalyzed by enzymes, and enzymes, of course, are protein encoded by genes. And so, uh, a lot of tools have been developed over the years, and I think that you know many of you who have um, had to deal somehow with bioinformatics tools. Maybe some of you had some experience with doing gene expression uh, analysis, I guess, you know, a lot of times what I hear from people, it's overwhelming. How do you know which tool to use for what? There are lots of them. There are lots of different tools. One does this but doesn't do that. What is the best tool for me and what is the best tool for uh, the type of analysis I want to do? Okay, to make, to make uh, a little sense out of this is, uh, well, I guess, you know, they, it helps to think about those things in sort of historic perspective a little bit. So when um, the um, when human genome uh, had been sequenced, it really um, triggered a lot of different uh, type of uh, bioinformatics activities and investigations. And one of these that is related to what we're going to discuss today, um, the um, uh, pathway databases started to appear. And one of the very first uh, pathway databases, and still the best known pathway databases, is uh, KEG database. Uh, KEG stands for Kyoto Encyclopedia of Genes and Genomes. And uh, so the core, the core of KEG is uh, what people call metabolic reconstruction, whole genome metabolic reconstruction. That is, when you take all the Mm, genes that are known in a particular genome, in our case, we will be interested in human today, uh, and then you try to uh, predict what enzymes are contained in this organism, and you try to put that information to together with the known biochemistry, uh, what metabolites are there, what reactions they're involved in, and try to kind of, you know, compile it into uh, the metabolic networks. Okay? So that's one type of... Uh, Tool, and I'll talk about it in a little bit more detail. Okay, the next generation uh, uh, of tools, and so, but, but the sorts of things that you can do with this database, basically, you know, you can print this metabolic pathway, you can look at it, obviously, and if you have, if you have measured some metabolites, you can sort of map them on this, onto this metabolic pathway. And it's a perfectly legitimate thing to do, and I'm sure that many of you have seen um, figures like this in published literature, a lot of those where, you know, things are drawn over the pathways, this metabolite goes up and this metabolite goes down and this enzyme is involved and so on and so forth, right? And this is a great and perfectly legitimate thing to do, but I don't need to explain to you that this is a low resolution thing, right? So if you have a handful of metabolites and you know a lot about the biology of the system, that will that is a great way to do it, okay? But if we're talking about unbiased hypothesis generating studies, this sort of thing really will not get you very far, okay? Well, unless you have, you know, several very hardworking students or postdocs who are willing to work day and night, but still, you know, it's not a useful or productive thing to do, okay? And then, uh, so recognizing that a number of uh, different tools starting, uh, started to sort of people developed a number of different tools, and uh, so one, this particular one um, uh, is called Omics Viewer. This is from Peter Karp's group, and uh, so they have metabolic this group has metabolic reconstructions for uh, for a variety of different organ organisms, primarily bacteria. They're known uh, originally for, for their ecocyc. Um, uh, database and you know metabolic uh, pathways and E. coli and well, what you can do with this tool, you can map your experimental data on it and it will sort of show you this animated picture. And I'm not going to talk much more about this. This is, I guess, you know, well, I mean, um, you can use it. It's not entirely practical and there, this, there's not a whole lot that you can do with this tool. Here's another example uh, several years ago. Uh, 
um, a group in Germany de uh, developed this uh, tool called uh, Wanted, and there you can also map your mm, metabolites, map your metabolomics data onto uh, biological pathways. Moreover, you can supply your own biological pathways. I believe it does not have a database uh, behind it. And um, this can be used. I mean, I personally found that they, it's an interesting tool. The steep, uh, there is a pretty steep learning curve. And uh, so uh, um, then I'll talk in more detail about some other tools. But while we're at it, I mean, I want to point out that in your uh, folders um, uh, uh, on this slide, there are um, URLs for all these tools. So if you want to, if you're interested, you can just follow up and click and, you know, to see more about what they can do. So you have that information right here in the corner. Okay. And uh, so while we're at it, the other thing that I want to say is that all the tools um, that I have here on this slide are um, open source. They're all in the public domain. You don't need license. You, uh, if you come from an academic institution, they're free, and uh, there are no restrictions on using them. Uh, the, uh, there are also uh, several commercial tools. I mean, not surprising, right? And probably two most known and widely used tools are Ingenuity, uh, Ingenuity um, Pathway Analysis. And the other one is uh, Metacore by Gene Go. The, com uh, the company is here in Michigan, actually. And so Ingenuity, in particular, is pretty expensive. And um, I, we have several licenses here at the University of Michigan, several labs and several groups have them. And I have used it. Uh, and um, so I think the, uh, th these are good, you know, useful tools. And um, the chief complaint that I heard from people, and I certainly feel that my, uh, like that myself, is that essentially uh, with commercial tools, it's a bit of a black box. Okay, so you're putting your data in, and you're getting back some networks and some mappings and some things, but you don't really understand what, <laughs> what went on and, you know, what you can and cannot find, and what are the limitations. So, I mean, I will admit that I'm biased on, uh, in this particular, on this particular issue, but that's the sort of complaint that I heard from other people, and I think it's, to some extent, it's justified. Also, these are nice, powerful tool, and if you have access, I think, uh, to this, uh, one way or another, it's worth exploring. I mean, the main focus of these tools, uh, I think, still remains on analysis of gene data, gene expression data, for example, microarray data or something like this. But they have done some things, so you can put uh, in a list of compounds, metabolites. Okay? So now I'll, I want to focus uh, for a minute on uh, CAC database and uh, to tell you um, a little bit about that. So. Uh, because I think it's important to understand certain things. So originally, when uh, CAG database was constructed, the um, uh, idea that um, the creators of CAG had in mind uh, was to construct reference pathways. So, uh, so they created a metabolic map that includes all possible pathways. Okay, not all possible uh, pathways are necessarily present in any given organism. Okay, and so the idea you know, at that time was uh, kind of, you know, to understand metabolism as a whole. And we're coming at it right now in this particular sort of, at this particular moment, we're looking at it uh, from a perspective. We want to annotate the experimental data that we got uh, from, you know, core lab, from a particular uh, method, from a particular experiment. So, uh, and this is a very important sort of, you know, philosophical difference that sort of comes into play. But nonetheless, so they have um, they have metabolic pathways, and this is everything that you would expect, carbohydrate, energy, uh, lipid nucleotide, amino acid, and so on and so forth, uh, and non-metabolic genetic information processing, environmental information, cellular pr processes, uh, in human disease, and uh, recently have added drugs. So they have all the variety of different pathways. and. So this is an example of uh, glycolysis, which I'm sure many of you have seen one, in one form or another. And uh, so this is an example of non-metabolic MAP kinase signaling pathway. And um, so uh, until recently, uh, the, the CAC database was completely free and completely open. 
And it's not the case anymore. As in, you can go and query it, uh, browse through the web, uh, through the browser web pages. You can do that, and there is no fee for that. But if you want to download the data, uh, then um, there is a pretty uh, substantial license fee. And uh, so we consider it because this is something that, you know, one of the tools that I'm going to talk, uh, tell you about that we have developed here is using. But the catch is that even if we do pay that license and download that data, I don't think we can, um, uh, if you put it sort of, you know, on the back end of our software, that would be redistributing their data, and I don't think we are allowed to do that anyway. So there should be other options other than um, CAC database for doing that. Okay, and so these other options uh, are, oops, sorry. Okay, thank you. Um, these are uh, these other options uh, are um, basically other human metabolic reconstructions, and I've mentioned uh, that um, sort of you know CAG was uh, sort of constructed as a reference database, and later on uh, a number of different groups went on to construct um, human specific and other organism specific uh, rather detailed uh, metabolic reconstructions. So I'm mentioning two. Here, uh, one is from Bernard Paulson's lab, and uh, it is called um, it is called BIGG, or uh, mm, that's the name of their database. And the other one comes from Scotland, from uh, uh, and it is called Edinburgh Human Metabolic Network. And so, mm, most recently, I don't even have it on my slide. Mm, earlier this year, um, so I mean. There are differences uh, between these databases on how they uh, basically, you know, how they handle their pathways, and um, as you can imagine, difference, uh, differences as how to, you know, what sort of IDs they use for their compounds and so on and so forth. So it was very uh, difficult. I mean, both are, you know, bo both contain very useful information about metabolic pathways, and I hope you will see why I'm going through this in such great detail when I'm doing the demo, because I think that's when you might have questions. So what exactly am I looking for? So, And so this, this is going to be important. So anyway, uh, earlier this year, these two groups and several others came together to reconcile their metabolic reconstruction and uh, came up with a joint paper and publication and the data set that, is, uh, that goes with it, which is sort of, you know, this community driven metabolic reconstruction, which is quite useful. And um, so the tool that I'm going, our tool that I'm going to tell you about is right now, um, and I will show you, is version two. And so we want, in version three, we want to go to that combined metabolic reconstruction, which basically have more, will have more, de more accurate uh, information and more details on some pathways, okay? And I will talk about that a little bit more later. So um, uh, generally speaking, uh, the purpose of doing all of this, and you know, for our sort of purpose, uh, um, is uh, all this metabolic reconstruction. Uh, so we want to be able to use them uh, as a context for experimental data. That is, you know, if I have in particular amino acids that are changing uh, in my experiment, and I want to know what uh, part of metabolic network they're in, and you know what what pathways and you know what other entities might be affected, right? And that that's what I mean by utilizing prior knowledge of metabolic networks. And uh, if we have a complex experiment with a number of uh, measurements and number of observations, time points, and so on and so forth, um, as I said be before, it becomes very confusing very quickly. We want some kind of you know uh, uh, mapping and some kind of you know, software to help us handle that. Okay, this is a tool from um, um, University of Alberta from David Wishard's lab uh, that they published in uh, bioinformatics. This tool is called MATPA, and it's on the web. Also, I have to tell you that now they actually combine several of their tools that they published into a single package that is called Metabo Analyst. And so this is one of them. So it does this pathway mapping, and um, so you know you can sort of see this is glycine ser uh, serine three in metabolism, and so so that's the metabolic pathways, the compounds in a pathway, and if you mouse over, I believe, a particular compound, and so they're color coded. The most significant are red here. Then you know you can see this uh, plot over here. Okay, so it's a web 
space to completely open source, you can try it. Um, the, uh, uh, the, um, so th this is just, you know, another tool from the same group. Like I said, they're, all, they're both part of the same package now. And uh, so this particular tool uh, is doing what is called metabolite enrichment analysis, okay? It is called MSEA. I don't know how many people here had experience with analyzing gene expression data. If you did, maybe you heard of a tool for uh, analyzing gene expression data uh, from Broad Research Institute that is called GSEA. Okay, so MSEA is the same concept, and I'll explain it in a minute. But I just kind of want to stop here for a second. We did not, um, since we switched the order of the talks, we didn't talk much about uh, statistical analysis of the data. And what I wanted to point out here, and uh, hopefully you will hear that talk a little bit later today from uh, Kirby Shedden, and um, he will probably mention, and we talk, mentioned some methods yesterday, uh, like random forest, like um, uh, PCA, and so on and so forth. Okay, this package, Metabo Analyst, what you need to know is that it has some tools for uh, statistical analysis of the data and uh, data normalization, and it is all web-based, okay? And I just want to uh, kind of uh, warn you, and I mean, I found, I found it re uh, reasonably easy to use and very user-friendly. But the danger is that just because you can put your data in and get some pretty pictures, which you will, it does not necessarily mean that um, it's going to be meaningful. In other words, I mean, I think the ease of use in this case is misleading. You have to think very carefully about what you're doing and whether the separation that you've assist is going to be significant and uh, look carefully at the parameters uh, that go with it that can sort of inform you of how good your model is and uh, whether how much you can trust it. So just because it's very easy to click through it, it doesn't, once you get the data into the right format, which is, you know, reasonably well illustrated, I think it's easy. You can do it like all in under 10 minutes, okay? PCA, PLSDA, you name it, everything. Normalization before that and, you know, pathway analysis, it's very easy. <laughs> the difficult part is just, you know, pulling it sort of, you know, uh, apart and figuring out what really went on. So I just kind of want to warn you. So this is like another extreme. This is a very uh, user-friendly tool. And, you know, I guess, you know, if it's easy to use, I mean, I might say that it is, you know, well-designed. But uh, <laughs> don't let that kind of, you know, fool you. Okay? So anyway, uh, I just wanted to say a few words about this uh, enrichment analysis. Okay? And uh, so the idea of the, this enrichment testing, as I said, really comes from uh, analysis of gene expression data. Okay, and so there the question uh, that you often ask, so if you have analyzed like a you know, chip full of data, maybe you have 20,000 genes, and it's not feasible to uh, mm, test them one by one or sort of, you know, verify, I mean, what you can do with this list, of course, you can rank it by some kind of significance if you compare two uh, conditions and, you know, control and uh, some sort of, you know, treatment or control and disease or whatever, I mean, then you will have some different genes that are differentially expressed. But uh, just because, uh, you know, something changed maybe 200 times, it does not necessarily mean that this is the most biologically relevant gene in your system and doesn't mean that what you want, uh, this is what you want to look at and focus at. Okay, but uh, what uh, uh, a better question to ask, and that's what, you know, people came up with to analyzing this data. Okay, well, um, what about, uh, I mean, there are various sort of, you know, predefined gene sets. For example, there are pathways, right, like keg pathways. And these keg pathways, they contain genes, right? And so uh, if you look at uh, your uh, data set, you can ask uh, what biologically related predefined sets of genes or metabolites, because we're going to talk about metabolites, are enriched with differentially expressed genes from my high throughput experiments, such as microarray. Okay? And that's basically the uh, question that uh, all these tools are trying to answer. Okay? And so you can look at it this way. This sort of illustrates. And this, this is the same uh, idea behind metabolite enrichment testing, basically. Okay? So in your uh, gene set, you look at genes that uh, uh, have changed and have not changed 
and you look at the proportion of genes that changed and not changed in a gene set, let the gene set be a pathway, for example, right? So, and, uh, so then what you can do is basically you can make a two-by-two two table, change, not changed in gene set, not in gene set, uh, set right? And uh, then you can sort of, you know, uh, uh, statistically test this and see if the enrichment uh, is statistically significant. From this, you can sort of, you know, calculate uh, the significance. Okay, and this is of often done by uh, using Fisher's exact test, for example. And there are other methods, the MFEA program that I just mentioned, actually using something uh, slightly different, but um, I will not go into details of that. I just wanted to get you, uh, wanted to, you, you to get a feel for what it is. And so the output of this is now not a list of, not a ranked list of genes. Uh, an output of a program like this would be an, uh, a, a list of ranked pathways, okay? Pathways that are ranked by significance, okay? Right. Yes, please. Um, so just so I'm clear, the not in the gene set list is the list that wasn't maybe on your metabolomics platform, but is in the pathway that you're looking at? Okay, let's see here. Uh, so in gene set, uh, yeah, okay, so what, what, it, what it tells me, uh, there are a total of 50 genes, right? Uh, maybe the, the all, all 50 are in one pathway, okay? And uh, the remainder of the gene, uh, genes on the microarray, uh, 10,000 genes here, are um, not, I mean, they are outside of that particular pathway. Does that make sense? When you say a list of branch pathways, you mean the pathways that these metabolites belong to, or? Uh, that's correct. Okay. Yes, and I'll show that to you. I'm, I'm going there. I'll show that to you. But uh, that's what, basically, you know, that's what you can sort of, you know, that's the sort of thing that you can expect with this, from this metabolite enrichment analysis program. Now, uh, honestly, the caveat is that I tried this program, and you know, a lot, and I talked to other people who tried it. Uh, it works okay. It is extremely hard to get any really meaningful, significant results. That's uh, that has been my issue so far. So you can you can try it. I mean, it's certainly worth a shot. But how much you're going to believe the results is basically, you know, up to you, because at this point, uh, I don't honestly believe that we're quite there yet with this sort of programs. But I have another sort of, you know, goal in the back of my mind why I went into on to, display, uh, to explain the enrichment analysis right now. So I, uh, that had a purpose. Okay, so anyway, so I, um, I, I wanted to sort of, you know, reiterate a few more uh, points here. Basically, to explain why we decided to develop our tool in the first place. Obviously, we're not uh, completely satisfied with what we were getting uh, from these other tools that I've mentioned. And so, among other things, we wanted to integrate, integrate multidimensional data. And what I mean by multidimensional data, I mean different omics data. Okay, and I'm going to show you an example of that, and I'm going to also show you when I show you the program during the demo this afternoon. Okay, we wanted to provide a broader view of metabolic networks, and uh, that is create not a pathway by pathway view, but just you know a view of. I mean, I mean it by a view of network rather than a look at it pathway by pathway, and we wanted to uh, link this to you know, somehow to disease information. Okay, and so what you know, have been mentioned several times, and you have seen a version of this slide. Uh, um, yesterday, I think, Sub showed that uh, this is our tool Netscape, and uh, we published it last year. And so this, first of all, I have to give credit to the people who uh, developed this tool. Uh, actually, um, Tim Hall is the um, sort of, you know, main developer, and Tim unfortunately left the group, unfortunately for us, but fortunately, for him, he's working at UCSD on the uh, Cytoscape uh, tool. And what I should have said already is that uh, this tool Netscape is a plugin for Cytoscape. And it's an open source general purpose network analysis and visualization tool. And uh, Glenn Tarsia and Terry Ramos are two other people 
uh, who worked on development of this tool. And so uh, the, this sort of you know, shows the general workflow that you uh, can uh, sort of you know, use with this tool. Okay? So you can start with metabolomics data, which is represented by the spectra here. And um, then you, know, you can submit your metabolomics data to Medscape. And what it will do, it will generate um, different, it can generate different kinds of network graphs. Okay? To be specific, four different, ki uh, four different type of network graphs. The more detailed one uh, is here. It shows compounds, reactions, enzymes, and genes as nodes. So everything is a node, and hence different colors and shapes. And I will uh, talk about that more during the demo. Okay? And uh, so the other types of graphs are really you know, simplified. So uh, this particular type has only compounds and genes as nodes. And this has only compounds or compound and reactions as nodes. The information content is really the same. It's just a diff different graphical representation. And so what you can do, though, is you can highlight your experimental uh, genes or metabolite and visualize the changes and the direction of the change and the magnitude of the change and the significance of the change. Okay? And also, um, there is an option to uh, put gene expression data at the same time. You don't have to if you don't want to. If you don't have gene expression data, uh, it's not a requirement, but you can. And you can sort of you know, merge these data sets into a one large network, which I will show you in just a little bit. Okay? And the third possible output, I, I'm sorry, the third possible input uh, to the program is uh, a set of enriched pathways. And that such set of enriched pathways can be generated by any number of uh, um, gene set of gene set enrichment programs, including GSEA that I've mentioned, or the program uh, that uh, we developed here, Marine Sartor has developed, uh, that is called LRPath. And uh, so Marine is my collaborator in the Department of Computational Medicine and Bioinformatics, and we actually incorporated this program. So if you have uh, a set of gene expression data, you can just put that and run LRPath from within uh, this tool Medscape. But that we will not be trying today because I, it takes a little while to run, so it's not, I, as I learned, it's not the best thing to do for the demo. Okay? So this shows the uh, web page for our uh, um, program, and so there are, I'll go over that in more detail during the demo, but I'll just tell you that there are several different ways to launch the program. Uh, you can do it right from the web page uh, with uh, Java Web Start. It's a Java-based um, um, program. And uh, the other way to uh, start the program is actually, uh, if you have administrative rights to your machine, it's very easy to go to siteescape.org. And uh, all the links, by the way, are uh, on this web page, so you can uh, sort of you know, find all the details there. Uh, and install SiteScape, and then uh, install Medscape plugin. Okay? And uh, so that's how you can start the program. And uh, that's what I think I just said, being highlighted here. Uh, the tabs across that page, uh, notice that there is a help page. And so we have a rather detailed manual. Uh, Netscape user manual. We have a video tutorial, although I have to apologize. I just checked the web page, and I think that link somehow mysteriously disappeared. So we will put it back. There is a video tutorial, uh, which will be there, there shortly. And uh, in the meantime, like I said, there is a very detailed user manual and uh, you know, uh, sufficient, I hope, sufficient details about what the input file should look like. That's what on that page, okay? So let me just sort of, you know, briefly tell you what is, um, so I complained about black box behind the commercial tools. So there's no black box here. So I, uh, I, I, they, uh, for better or worse, we can explain exactly what we did in that program, okay? And so, uh, so I've mentioned all of these databases uh, that contain uh, the information about metabolites, reactions, uh, human metabolic networks, pathways. Okay, and so uh, basically, the, as you can easily understand, the relationships between compounds, reactions, enzymes, and genes, these are all many to many. Okay, and so we capture that information. 
is there a question? Okay. Okay. Uh, we kept, we capture all of this uh, information in the relational database that uh, we have locally here at the University of Michigan, and uh, that is database is um, sitting behind this Medscape tool. Okay, and we query it when you know you submit your list of metabolites that you know run that query and query that database. Okay, so this is the site Escape home screen. And uh, so that's what you will see when you first start the pro uh, program. So this is a network window. That's where your networks will be built. This is called data panel. That's you know where where is additional information will appear. And I'll show you. Uh, so the list of networks that you will build will be here. And this is sort of a navigation uh, window here. Okay. So uh, now just you know quick word about input file uh, format. I mentioned that uh, you can have three types of input files and all of them are optional. I mean, uh, or you can enter one metabolite just, you know, from, from you know, the, in the tool itself. You don't have to upload the files. If you just, you know, want to quickly look at a small metabolic network and just enter compounds, for example, by hand, you still uh, can. Okay? So, uh, so here is the list of compounds. Here they're referenced by keg ID. But you can also use, in addition to keg ID, you can use compound name. Okay? And that begs the question. Anybody who looked at metabolite names is going to say, OK, well, how are you going to do that? <laughs> OK? And um, okay, I will not pretend that it is a solved problem. Uh, so but what we do is we store a rather extensive list of synonyms. OK? And, um, uh, we do search these synonyms and we give you possible options, which I will show you during the demo. So uh, it's not perfect, but it sort of works, right? Okay, gene file. Uh, the format very, is very simple. Uh, we use Entree Gene ID. You can use Gene Symbol, but I recommend uh, Entree Gene ID if you want to do that. And so uh, one thing that you know, I want you to kind of you know notice that this is already. Uh, uh, so we're looking at processed data. So we have uh, p-values here, for example, and uh, in this case, log fault change. Um, same is uh, true for metabolites. Medscape can handle uh, fault change or log fault change. I believe that's, you know, that is working equally well. Okay, and uh, so uh, I will. I think I will sort of, you know, uh, uh, save for the details for the demo, and I'll just show you quickly what that. Uh, uh, in, uh, we, okay, we call it a concept file here, but what it is, it's essentially a list of enriched uh, pathways which have been generated by this program LRPath. And so what you see here is, uh, if you look at the second column, so this will be a concept name, citrate cycle, DNA replication, uh, pyrimidine metabolism, and so on and so forth. This is a number of genes in a pathway and, you know, various other parameters, but uh, your significance essentially, uh, I mean, and these are ranked by significance. So here's the p-value, here's false, dis false discovery rate, and this last column just lists uh, the significant genes that are driving that enrichment. That's what the typical output of that program looks like, okay? Mm -hmm. Here, I just want to go to a specific example and show you how this tool can be used. And so this is basically a teaser, and it goes to uh, uh, sort of, you know, uh, Chuck will give a talk a little bit later where he will tell you how this tool was actually used to get some useful information uh, from uh, the metabolomic da metabolomics data. This particular uh, data set comes from uh, this very interesting uh, red. So um, what you see here are two um, different breeds of uh, red. So they were bred um, uh, with respect to their running capacity. So uh, um, um, Steve Britton and Lauren Koch here at the University of Michigan uh, have done this experiment. Actually, it lasted many, many years. So they bred this. Uh, consistently bred these uh, rats for their capacity to run. So they exercise them, they um, then, you know, cross them, and then uh, they went through many, many generations of these uh, rats. And uh, so as a result, they differ uh, uh, significantly in their 
uh, running capacity, okay? Uh, so, uh, low cap so here LCR st stands for uh, low capacity runner uh, versus high capacity runner uh, reds. Okay, so compared compared to LCR, HCR reds uh, can run longer and faster. They eat the same and gain, gain less uh, weight, and they have healthier metabolic phenotypes. Okay, and on top of that. If it, if it wouldn't be enough, they actually even live longer. And that sounds like a wonderful uh, trait. And, you know, wouldn't you want to, you know, be able to uh, be lean and live longer? And, you know, that all sounds wonderful. And uh, uh, so apparently they uh, utilize fatty acids for fuel when, uh, when exercising. So I hear that the only problem uh, with this is that they're extremely mean. And so somehow that goes with that trait. So anyway, uh, so but the data that I'm going to show you and that we loaded uh, to Medscape uh, are essentially gene expression data from Illumina uh, microarray from uh, skeletal muscle. Okay, and so we ran this program LRPath on uh, the gene expression data to identify enriched pathways. And uh, in addition to this, we have metabolic profiles uh, of these animals after 10 minutes of uh, running, okay? And that's the data that I'm going to show you uh, in Medscape, okay? So let me just sort of, you know, go over that a little bit more. Before that, I showed you just an you know, empty blue screen, right? Okay, here you have um, here we have a drop down, so you can select an organism. So when you're working with just metabolites, it does not matter. You don't have to select the organism, whether you're working with rat or mouse or human. Uh, it, it, metabolites are the same; it's not going to make any difference. But if you're loading gene data, that is important. If you do not select the correct organism, uh, the program is not going to recognize the uh, gene list that it, uh, that you give it. Okay. Uh, Okay, then, um, so the data that we loaded, you know, shows up here, right? So these are the CAG IDs, that, these are the uh, metabolite names. So in this box it says compounds. Here's a box that says genes. That's where, you know, you can see which genes we loaded. Okay, and uh, so uh, here is this list of enriched uh, pathways or uh, concepts, and this is pretty similar to what I showed you in an input file. So it was read directly from an in input file, okay? And so now, uh, what you see here is really uh, hairball, okay? It's a huge mess, and how can you look at it? Oh my God, how can I ever make sense out of it, okay? And so one thing that we uh, build into this uh, program is uh, essentially an ability to subset and filter data very quickly by a variety of different uh, parameters, okay? And so the easiest way to subset the data, let's say you're interested in uh, branched chain, chain amino acid metabolism, okay? So what I did here and what I'm showing you, which you cannot see, but I'll show you during the demo and hopefully you'll be able to see it better, I selected valine leucine isoleucine uh, pathway here, okay? And what happened was everything that is related to this pathway in this big network got selected. Now, I have a button here which says create subnetwork, okay? And if I click that button, create subnetwork, it creates a smaller subnetwork uh, for me where I can look at the details of the data. And so it's very, I mean, uh, again, during the demo, I show, I'll show you, uh, it's very easy to zoom in and out and look at the details, but nonetheless, this is a useful way to subset the data, okay? So, and one thing that you can see is that leucine, valine, and isoleucine uh, clearly go down, and uh, the fact that they, these nodes have green border around them means that uh, they're highly significant, and some of the enzymes here uh, that, you know, we know this from gene expression data, genes enco encoding some of, of the enzymes, or transcripts rather, seem to be going up significantly, and that's the reason why this uh, pathway came up um, pretty high uh, with respect to p-value, okay? And like I said, um, Chuck will hopefully talk to you more about the biology and what it means in terms of this particular example, but I'm just sort of highlighting different features here, okay? To get more information about any of the nodes, 
All you have to do is double click the node and this panel on the side will appear and there are some uh, links here and some additional information here. And um, so, um, like I said, more details are forthcoming during um, the demo, but I just want to uh, sort of wrap up that part. And um, to summarize, I want to tell you that, you know, we tried to build it as a um, user-friendly, versatile uh, tool, and it has a lot of different features. And uh, the things that I did not talk about are dynamic visualization. We have some animations. So, I mean, there is really a lot more than I can cover in this sort of, you know, brief overview. And most importantly, what I um, want to tell you is that um, this is work in progress, and we're actually going to uh, now, uh, we're starting to develop version three of the tool. And so if you try it and if you download it, and if you have any uh, questions, first of all, do not hesitate to ask. And uh, also, your suggestions would be very timely because that would be something we would be able to incorporate into the new version. And we have some, you know, idea for the features that we want, but uh, additional in, uh, input is also welcome. Okay, and so um, the uh, um, now that I've told you how you know wonderful of a tool we built and you know how great it is working and everything is uh, fine. So now I think would be a good time to talk to you about limitations of the uh, pathway mapping. Okay. And there are some serious limitations, okay? So, and I'll be honest with you, uh, in the type of data that you get from uh, the um, core, uh, for example, in my experience, you can, you can only map roughly about half of metabolites to uh, um, metabolic pathways that we have in this tool. And this is not surprising. So if you remember that Tanu showed you a sort of map of metabolic pathway coverage, and uh, I mean there were a lot of colored spots there, but there were a lot of like gray white stuff. Okay, and as she said, we're trying to sort of maximize this coverage and do things about it. But uh, in the meantime, what it is doing uh, for us? So we talked yesterday also about detection uh, limits of different methods. So basically, uh, from LCMS, I think on average you can get maybe 300 named metabolites. What does that mean if you map only half? Well, that means that you only get about uh, 150 of this mapped, right? And so if you go to uh, GCMS or NMR, these numbers are even less. Also, I mean, again, those of you who uh, have had, had some experience maybe with uh, analysis of gene expression data, people always ask the question, and it's a rightful question, so what about unknown pathways? You're mapping everything to known pathways, right? So how, how am I to find something you know, beyond that, right? And so um, I think that's a very good question, right? So, and so uh, to address some of these um, questions, we actually, you know, we um, realized by looking at, you know, metabolites and, you know, published literature, okay, so what do you do when you cannot map something to metabolic pathways? Well, you know, short from like going and Googling it, uh, well, what do you do? You go search the literature, okay? You go to uh, um, HMDB database uh, at the University of Alberta, you go search PubMed, right? And so this tool that uh, we built that we call metab to mesh uh, we actually uh, did just that, just, you know, on a large scale, okay? So uh, we basically, you know, downloaded the entire PubMed and took all the PubMed articles, and the National Library of Medicine tags uh, all published articles with medical subject headings or MASH terms, and they also create a very large uh, file that they call substances, which lists all kind of chemical substances, okay? And then uh, we downloaded a PubChem database, which has something like, you know, 30 million compounds or maybe even more. Now, okay, and then we merged these two data sets, but if you just, you know, map one to another, uh, you will get, uh, you will come up with a huge number of false positive hits, okay? So we felt we needed some kind of measure of uh, sort of, you know, significance of the associations between the two. And so what we did was, uh, we did basically, you know, Fisher's exact test and set a pretty strict cutoff as to, uh, you know, what we call a significant association. And this resulted in the data set, uh, 
and uh, they, we have a sort of web-based tool which is which has the same name and uh, it is called Metab to Mesh. And these are the people who uh, worked on this. Maureen Sartor I've mentioned her, Alex Aid, and uh, Zach Wright, and uh, so in our department. Okay. And so if you look at this tool, uh, so so this is a simple uh, interface. Like I said, you can sort of search compounds one at a time. I'm showing the results here for searching for cyclic AMP. And uh, then, you know, I'm sort of filtering various mesh headings that I found as a result. So I'm looking at, at the diseases. And so cyclic AMP is here. And these are the significant connections through the literature to various disease terms that we found. The top one is neuroblastoma. And if I go here and click on this link, PubMed articles, this will take me to PubMed and to the list of articles that actually substantiate this. Uh, um, uh, this connection here, okay? And so, well, you may look at it and say, okay, well, what's the big deal? So if I go to PubMed, forget your tool, if I go to PubMed and search for cyclic AMP in neuroblastoma, would I not find that link? Would I not find that articles? Well, the answer is yes, you would, okay? Well, but the problem is that uh, you would have to do it for each and every uh, metabolite that you do. And I mean, I think that, you know, as a human being, as a scientist, I mean, obviously, uh, you know, you're reading the articles, you will learn something new. It's a useful exercise, right? But uh, what we can do with this data set uh, that we now generated, we can uh, do various computations using this data set, such as using, use it in metabolite enrichment analysis, which is something that we're currently working on, or such as uh, the um, experimental plugin that we have that uh, uh, we call med disease that I'm about to show you, okay? So uh, I think I can just skip that. And so this, um, what I'm showing you here, is a relatively small metabolic network. And you cannot see it, but just have to, you'll have to take my word for it. In the middle of it is amino acid glycine. And uh, so I just, you know, um, entered glycine um, here and just, you know, build a very simple network, okay? And now this little plugin that we have, there is like a drop down and an option where I can basically, uh, mm, what I can do is I can say filter by mesh terms. And so my mesh terms uh, now are, uh, all appear in that window down here. And so I can just, you know, if I go to a particular disease, and this, um, yeah, uh, in this case, I'm looking at uh, prostate cancer, prostate, uh, prostate neoplasms, okay? If I look at that and select this, uh, uh, respective nodes in the network get selected, and so one of the compounds selected here is sarcosine. And uh, Sub mentioned yesterday in his uh, talk the work that has been done here uh, in Arul Chinayan's lab and, you know, in collaboration with some people here. And so what you can do then, if you right-click on the node, and I don't know if I have that, uh, but um, again, you'll have to take my word for it then. So if you, if you right-click on the node, then it will take you to the articles that will show you connection to disease. So basically what we're doing here, we're, go, we're not relying on metabolic pathways anymore. We're relying on this information that have been uh, uh, derived from the literature and that covers much broader set of metabolites. So uh, if there is any connection like this, significant connection to a disease, that's, that's how you would find it, and that's how you would annotate this network, OK? Again, uh, this has not been published yet. So uh, we have an experimental website, uh, and that's where you can find uh, this beta version. Try it at your own risk. It's not running on a production server. I don't think I will demo it today, because it has been flaky. And, um, but you're welcome to try it, and that's where you can get more information about the other things that you can do. Uh, that's all, also all on Medscape uh, website. I believe there is an address in your slides. And I think with this, I'll stop and take any questions. Can you do some bacteria? I noticed you have mouse and human, but. Yeah. No, unfortunately, right now we cannot. We're really. Okay, so what's behind this tool are human metabolic networks, okay? And what we do with uh, 
Um, so, uh, so the metabolic network is human, but in addition to human genes, we have a set of mouse and rat genes. And, what we, and we just use homology gene to map uh, to mouse and you know, rat um, orthologs. No, unfortunately, we don't. And this is probably the most frequently asked question that I uh, get about other organisms. People wanted us to add Drosophila, you know, obviously bacteria. And, you know, it's not a difficult thing to do. I think uh, the way to go probably is what, what becomes difficult is if you have to maintain all this databases for different organisms. I don't think it would be feasible unless, you know, you plan to, you know, have a small company, like, you know, and have, like, you know, 15 employees who are, like, dedicated to doing this. But I think what we probably can do is we can create a simple interface where you can put your own uh, pathways. So, for example, you know, if you're interested in a particular bacteria, say an E. coli, right? And if you can download uh, these metabolic pathways, and they're pretty standard formats for pathways nowadays, uh, I think what we can allow is just, you know, you load that, and then you get all the functionality of the tool with that. Okay, I think that's what I, you know, that seems like a more feasible way. And then it becomes your responsibility. If you are not seeing certain pathways, if something is not up to date, you have to go and add it to your input file, basically. So what it would require, in addition to any sort of, you know, experimental files that I entered, you would have to provide one more input file, your pathways. And it's a very simple format. It would be like, you know, basically three or four columns and just, you know, gene reaction, metabolites, that sort of thing. Metabolic networks in bacteria would be quite similar to what you find. Yeah, the the unique genes. metabolites are the ones that are unique. So the genes would be completely different. That, but, but, but would this pull up the gene, like if you put in the, um, the gene sequence code, would that be able to pull it or find out what it is? Or? No. Right now we would no, not. No, we don't. Right now we would not. You would have to provide that information uh, with your input file. But bacterial genomes uh, generally are small, so. Support bacterial. Uh, if you do transcriptomics, you know. Yeah. Uh, uh, bacteria doesn't side escape. And, uh, there's ways. Of, there is ways of doing it. Right? Yeah. Obviously. So, uh, yeah, Cytoscape itself is a very flexible tool, okay? And so uh, there are certainly ways of doing it. I mean, one of the problem, uh, problems of Cytoscape is that, uh, okay, well, the core Cytoscape, uh, I mean, it basically will allow you to in input genes and create networks. You can do that, right? But the problem is that there are a lot of different plugins, and they don't always not, uh, talk to each other. Uh, up until version 3 of Cytoscape, it was not a requirement, really. And so uh, hopefully it's going to change for the better. But having said that, uh, in my mind, like I said, it's pretty important to be able to uh, sort of, you know, let people input their own pathways. So in, in a more general sense, it's a similar uh, task to, like, you know, for example, if Chuck has more, uh, like, you know, lipid pathways that he's interested in, which he is, right? So you have that data, and uh, if you want to input that data to augment whatever pathway information we have there, uh, I think we should enable that, and it should be possible. And in that sense, uh, adding another organism, like bacterial uh, organism, is not that different from the sort of, you know, sort of in terms of what we have to enable. So I think it should be uh, done, and I think it should be possible. Expression data. Can you also use genome wide association data and input a list of genes that you find, you know, differences? Uh, you can. Uh, we haven't done anything specifically about that. What you have to think uh, think about, though, is you have to think about specific experimental design. I mean, it wouldn't care whether it's gene expression. There is nothing there that you know says that. Yeah. I mean, you can, uh, as, as long as it's a list of gene and some kind of, you know, p-value or something like this, you can do it. You have to carefully uh, think about the design and how you would interpret that. Mm -hmm. And I'd be happy to discuss that and, you know, how that can be done. Yeah. You mentioned that the FlexoLix is in the works. Is ah. Okay, yeah, I, I don't have a slide on that. Basically, what we did um, uh, there, so, okay, so the workflow is like this. So you input all your data, you big large net, uh, make 
some kind of bigger network, right? And then you select uh, regions of the uh, network, build smaller sub-networks that you're willing to look at, right? And so if you have fluxomics data or if you have you know, some time series data, what we have right now is you have, you, I mean, you can input that data and it will build sort of the animation for you that you can sort of, you know, either click through it or it will just, you know, Oh, you're going to show that. Okay, good. Yeah, because I, I, I didn't have that here, right? Okay. In the case of time, you had a slide that shows control, treatment one, and treatment two. Right. So that's about three. Uh, is there a limit of how meaningful that can be? Um, it can be, you know what? I don't know that there is a limit. I think you can have a lot more. I think, you know, I think it will get confusing. Um, I mean, I don't, as far as software is concerned, I don't think there is a limit. I think there is a sort of common sense limit. But it's not uncommon to have uh, three treatments and 10 time points. I mean, at the end of the day, you may want to look at them, like, you know, one by one or pair, pairwise or something like that. But I don't think the software is too limiting in that sense. I mean, it will allow you to do more, but it will just, you know, all flash between your eyes and it will not be. So, uh, I mean, you can kind of try it and see. Okay. Right. It's a very good question. And so to answer that question, I mean this MSEA tool that I've mentioned attempts to answer that question. Which pathway is more significant than the other? Here in Medscape right now we don't do that. Uh, we're working on a separate program, which we call uh, tentatively, excuse me, tentatively called concept metab. And uh, so we are looking at this sort of, you know, statistical ranking of pathways. Right now, we just don't do it uh, because we didn't find a meaningful way of uh, sort of robust way of doing it yet. I agree with you that this is a very important question. And so, okay, compared to genes, I guess, you know, I mean, genes are not, also not independent, but I think one of the biggest limitations to this I see when you're trying to calculate this. So the way we do it, we you know map metabolites to pathways, and you know then we kind of calculate this enrichment or whatever. But uh, uh, if you think about it, you know if you have you know substrate and the product, uh, and uh, so for example you know both are elevated. I mean this change is not completely independent. You can't. Com Consider the, uh, as independent, and so you know you you can you have to take into consideration all those things to develop something. So I think the there are several programs that I did not mention that try to calculate this pathway enrichment from metabolomics data, and um, I just don't think that they are quite there yet. <laughs> I mean, in our uh, in our hands, they did not give you know meaningful results. I mean, they give you some numbers, and again, this can be misleading. Just because you get, you know, something, it doesn't mean that it is robust or meaningful. So I think that's where the whole field is right now. Honestly, it's really, you know, state of the art. That's, yeah, but I agree with you that this is something that is much needed uh, for um, metabolomics to, you know, become a really high throughput science and, you know, true omics, if you will.